and yes, it's recording now. So let me uh, uh, take a few seconds. I think. Okay. 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 I think I have everybody muted now. Um, anyway, if you were with us last time, you know Rob. And uh, I, I want to mention that what he's going into tonight is actually his field of expertise. Uh, he has done over 40 years of research on Africa, particularly the Nile Valley civilization. He studied the Medu nature, the Egyptian hieroglyphs under the tutelage of Ankh Mira, the only African-American to write a grammar book on this ancient African language. He has sat at the feet of some of the world's most preeminent African scholars and went on a study tour to Kemet, that is the old name for Egypt, with Dr. Charles Finch, an internationally renowned Nile Valley civilization scholar and lecturer. Uh, Mr. Whiting has lectured in a variety of settings, including universities, schools, churches, and community groups up and down the East Coast and in Africa. And I was there at one time when Rob addressed an entire group of high schoolers brought in to see uh, Black Panther. Uh, invited by Arnold Anderson, may he rest in peace. And he had those kids full attention. I think you're in for a treat uh, with uh, Rob's wisdom and knowledge of African culture. So without further ado, go ahead, Rob. Okay, well, thank you, my uh -uh. I hear feedback. feedback. Is that for me? That's Harriet's computer. I oh, that's probably what it is. Harriet, you need to unmute your, you yeah, need un to unmute yourself. Yeah. Unmute? Un no, no, mute. There you go. Mute. That's, that's it. Good. OK. All right. Uh, thank you for that um, very kind introduction. Um, I, I want to, before I start, um, say that I had to really uh, say some prayers for this one, because we're going to get into some um, constructs that, uh, that are all encompassing. And so I'm pulling together information from just about every branch of science. And uh, so I, I had to pray that I would be able to explain this in such a way that all of you would, at the end of the session, leave here with a full understanding of what uh, transpired in Africa and how it has uh, totally impacted and transformed the world. Um, I also like to put in a plug, you know, we had the president here, um, Joe Matthews of the African American Culture Society in terms of this is part of our mission. Um, I'm the chairperson for the education committee and we are uh, the organization overall is tasked with uh, providing information uh, through the arts, uh, through lectures, through dance, uh, et cetera, about um, African and African-American accomplishments and history. It's a wonderful organization and I would encourage uh, any of you who are not members, and you don't have to live here in Palm Coast, you can be in Timbuktu and still become a member of um, AACS, to go to our Facebook page, uh, just type in African American Culture Society and it will come up and you can, and it can walk you through how to join. You can join online and you can use your credit card, et cetera, to become a member. Okay, with that, Oh, here we are. I, I want to start off with um, uh, some, my due respect to Dr. Charles Finch III. Um, uh, Dr. Finch is a physician by training, but like many of us, um, 
he was exposed to information uh, that he initially uh, found hard to believe, like most of us. And so he started doing intensive research um, and um, started writing a number of, of, of papers and he eventually uh, wound up writing two books, Echoes of the Old Dark Land and the Star Beat uh, Beginnings, The Genesis of African Science and Technology. Uh, he was also in charge of the International Health uh, Department at Morehouse College. He has since retired. But I went on a, a study tour of him to Kemet and um, it was intense. It was a study tour. He, we toured all day. We went to the temples. We went to the various archeological sites. Um, and at night he would spend two or three hours lecturing. So it was really, you're talking about a full day. It was a full day, but it was so rewarding. And uh, when we got to Harem Market, which is what the Africans called the, um, what we now call a Sphinx, which is what the Greeks renamed it. And uh, one of the reasons I always use the African names is because when you, when something is renamed, it loses it, the, its meaning. For example, Sphinx is just a Sphinx. I mean, it has, it has no history to it. But when you say high market, high market in the meta nature means Haru on the horizon. It's a big difference. When I look at this, this largest carving out of a single piece of stone in the world, even today, and I called it high market versus the Finks because high market, as I indicated, is facing between two of the uh, pyramids and when the sun comes up a certain time of year, a time of year the, the sun rays beam down on, on its face. Um, and last uh, month, I talked about the duality. Well, this represents duality because it's talking about the mind and it has a lion body, which is, represents the animalistic natures of our bodies. Our bodies bring all of these uh, animalistic natures um, greed, materialism, unbridled sex, um, anger, jealousy, envy. And the whole purpose of this um, high market is to show us that with the proper outlook of your mind and training, that your mind has the capability to overcome the animalistic natures of the body. Um, <clears throat> While Dr. Finch and I were standing in front of Harry Market, and after we had taken this photo, we started talking, and I come to find out that he was a member, we were members of the same fraternity. So this was a memorable occasion. And uh, I, um, I want to really thank him for uh, all of the knowledge that he has imparted to me and others. Now, <clears throat> it's really, important for us to understand that we have been miseducated, okay? One of the reasons that I am here tonight is because of the miseducation, because all of us should know this. The whole world should know what I'm talking about uh, uh, tonight and what I talked about last month. Uh, and in his book, The Miseducation of the Negro, which by the way, I would recommend everybody read. It, it, it really is a, a classic in terms of explaining how um, African Americans uh, were miseducated and are still continuing to be miseducated. But there's one part of that book that I want to bring to your attention. And he says, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. 
In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. Okay. Now, also, I want to give thanks and credit to Dr. Asa Hilliard III, who I um, spent a lot of time with him. And uh, he was a professor of educational psychology and a historian. And um, in fact, he toured and provided uh, uh, lectures and provided guidance to school systems all over the world. But one of the major things that he left behind was that he had this baseline studies that he developed a curriculum for incorporating some of what you are getting uh, uh, in these uh, Zoom sessions. And Portland, Oregon was the first school system in, in America to, uh, to adopt these, these baseline studies where they incorporate the true history of Africa. But what he, uh, and he wrote the forehead, I mean the foreword, I'm sorry, for um, a book, Stolen Legacy, written by George G.M. James, which is another classic. And in that foreword, this is what he says. Mental bondage is invisible violence. Former physical slavery has ended in the United States. Mental slavery continues to this present day. The slavery affects the minds of all people and in one way it is worse than physical slavery alone. That is the person who is in mental bondage will be self-contained. Not only will that person fail to challenge beliefs and patterns of thought which control him, he will defend and protect those beliefs and patterns of thought virtually with his last dying effort. Okay. Now here we have uh, Dr. Wade Nobles. And I think this is, sums up everything that I've said regarding this. The essence of power is to define someone else's reality and make them live according to that definition of reality as if it is their own. In other words, when Africans were enslaved, they couldn't become a slave until they lost their Africanness. They could not be an African with their keeping their languages, their culture, their rituals, their, their various ways of praising uh, their, their deities uh, and their communication apparatuses. All of that had to be taken away and erased before they could become slaves where they would be self-contained as Dr. Wade Nobles talked about that. On the plantation, they wouldn't even think about trying to escape if most of them wouldn't. Some did because their minds had been completely, uh, their reality had been completely replaced with the slave master's reality. Okay, I, I wanted to really focus on that initially because it's so important and as I go along, you're gonna understand what I'm talking about. I need to talk about the five branches of philosophy because metaphysics is one part of that branch, but it's the most important part. It's the foundation for philosophy because it's talking about beyond the physical. In other words, meta is, is beyond the physical. The things that we can't see versus the things that we can see. And um, I'm gonna explain that uh, in more uh, in depth later on. And then we have epistemology. How do we determine what is uh, uh, true? How do we determine what is false? And whether or not it can be justified and if that justification is valid. And of course we have the other three branches which are politics, ethics, and aesthetics. So, 
these are the five branches of philosophy. Now, all of you who have uh, taken courses in philosophy, you all have been taught that the Greeks were the originators of philosophy. Well, as we go through this, you're gonna see how untrue that is. Okay, so metaphysics is basically unseen science. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's talk about thunder and lightning. Before it, you hear the thunder or see the lightning, all of the ingredients that make that happen have already been put together, okay? And so that's unseen science. What we, what we see and hear is the seen science. We hear the thunder and we see the lightning. So what metaphys metaphysics does is go behind and explain what makes up uh, the components of lightning. And once we understand that and we can visualize it, then it becomes science. We now know how lightning, why lightning occurs. We now know why thunder occurs. Okay? So we're talking about the fundamental nature of reality. And that as part of that, our thoughts, words, actions, impact our world and our environment. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look at our perceptions and let's look at this pandemic. We have now people throughout the world who have various perceptions of the pandemic. Some people feel that it's no worse than a cold. Some people feel that it's basically going to go away on its own accord. Other people are taking it serious, seriously and they're wearing masks and they're social distancing. But all of those perceptions from different individuals are creating the reality that we are dealing with. Okay, now follow me here. So, all of those different perceptions that we have in America have created the situation where we now have over 220,000 deaths. Okay. Where we have millions of people who have been in, infected because of these perceptions of this pandemic. So our so our thoughts and our actions create our reality. Okay, follow me here now. Okay, the same thing with climate change. The warming of the planet is getting worse because of our perceptions and our thoughts about climate change because we have a number of humans who deny that what we're doing has any impact or very little impact on the fact that the planet is warming and getting warmer and warmer. So the way we perceive things as humans and how we react to those perceptions creates our reality. Now, in order to pull another piece of this together, we have to talk about energy, quantum physics. We now know through quantum physics that there's, that there's no matter, that there are no molecules or atoms. Even though they exist, they're all energy. Because when we've smashed the atoms, it's nothing but energy. Okay. And so energy is what is the universe is comprised of. 
So everything that we're looking for on the outside exists within us because we are energy. Now Einstein, who was one of the geniuses in the world, figured out through a formula how to bring that into reality, okay? Because again, you can't see energy, you don't feel energy, but through E uh, equals uh, matter times the speed of light squared, we can visualize it in terms of a formula. Okay, so he 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 he's brought it into our existence through E equals MC squared. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, I was fortunate enough to have experiences on my own, although at the time I, I experienced it, I didn't understand uh, what was going on. Uh, I've been meditating for approximately 40 years. I had been meditating for two or three years and I was uh, at the end of the day, I was in my office. So I decided to meditate before I left. And I went into a meditation and in that meditation, I felt as if I was, my body was falling and that I was floating like a feather through a funnel. It was like a funnel and my body was, just floating downward, but it wasn't frightening at all. It was as if I was in a free fall, but it was very comforting, very um, um, uh, satisfying. At some point in that fall, as my body was, was descending, I became cognizant of a, a pure, bright, white light. It was the purest and brightest white that I've ever seen in my life. And once I became cognizant of that light, this feeling of blissfulness, of total love over, over, overcome me. And I was there. And it, it was, I, I mean, it was something that I could stay there forever. I would never want to leave it because it was beyond anything that I could experience as a human in this dimension. It was beyond anything that I've ever experienced in terms of whether it's, you know, getting something materialistic or, or any of the other things that we get pleasure out of. And I don't know, so time was of no essence. So I don't have a clue as to what, what uh, how long it was, but for whatever reason, my body started uh, ascending floating back up through this funnel. And the further I got away from that bright white light, this feeling of euphoria, this feeling of blissfulness dissipated. I came out of the meditation and I had never experienced that before. So I thought I had fallen asleep. I said, oh, I just fell asleep I, I, and I had a dream. Because oftentimes in meditation, if you're tired, you will fall asleep. But for whatever reason, the body will wake you up in 20 minutes. I don't care. You will wake up in 20 minutes if you do fall asleep. So I thought I had fallen asleep. I gather my belongings and I walk down the hallway of the Treasury Annex, which is direct diagonally across from the White House. And as soon as I hit the door, and saw the light, I could see that everything was energy. The concrete, the wood, the trees, the leaves, uh, the, the, the dirt, everything had energy, uh, this vibration come, these vi vibrations coming from it. And they were in different colors. So I stood there stunned and uh, trying to get myself together because I could see everything was energy. Everything that I saw was energy. 
um, I finally got myself together, walked down the stairs. And then as I walked down the street, whenever I would come to another human, this feeling of euphoria would come over me again. This total love, this blissfulness would come back. That lasted for maybe a block or so. Then I was back to normal. And so I always wondered what, what was that? And so I read, oh, where, oh, wait a minute. I, where is I'm looking? Oh, here it is right here. Okay, I missed it. Right here. I was reading a book by uh, Dr. Uh, Ashby called The Hidden Properties of Matter. And this is what he says. When the mind and senses are transcended through the process of meditation, it is possible to discover that special ring wherein there is no vibration, no time, no space, there is neither existence nor non-existence, neither being nor non-being. It is the ring that is beyond all concepts of the mind, and it is the ring from which time and space emanate. In other words, what he's saying is that I was able to go beyond my senses and, and, and experience this, this space, this, 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 this ream of existence. So um, I know this is true because I experienced it. And I know that everything is energy because I experienced it. So, um, and I hadn't been drinking, by the way. I hadn't had an you know, afternoon drink, anything of that sort. So I was in sound, a sound mind um, and had all of my facilities um, uh, at that time. Okay, now let's move on. Um, I just wanted to bring to your attention that the Society of Biblical Literature uh, studies these ancient uh, texts. I've looked at a number of their write-ups about uh, some of these like the coming forth by day and the Nymphite theology. And they, uh, they, they have written extensively about these ancient writings. Now, what you see before you is the Shabaka stone. And the reason it's called Shabaka stone is because it was found uh, during the 25th dynasty, which is around 500, 600 uh, BCE before the common era. And uh, King Shabaka uh, was the uh, king at that time. But on it, what they found is the oldest creation story. You can't see, it's hard to see the meta nature, but there's, there's meta nature here on, on, uh, on the stone. And, and what, these, what the scribes had done is taken um, writings that were done during the old kingdom, which was approximately over 3,000 years prior to them finding this stone, and they had basically rewritten that story. Okay, so once it was deciphered, we find out that Africans over 6,000 years ago had grappled with the question of origin, of trying to understand the world. And it makes sense because they had been here for 200 to 300,000 years. Now they're saying 300,000 years. And they had tried to make sense of the world by coming up with the creation of the universe. The only way that they could do that was to bring this into reality, was to create a myth that would connect the invisible world, metaphysics, to the visible world. Okay, the same way Einstein has done with E equals MC squared. Through a formula, he brought the unseen to the seen. Okay, so. They, they created these myths 
to explain the universe and how it came to be. Now, how did they do that? They started out with the noon, which is the eternal waters. And the noon has no beginning and no end, but it contained everything that was necessary for the creation of the universe. It was in existence before the cosmos came into existence. And it's the, it's, it was the original concept of divine thought and command. So what this concept does, it, it makes it possible for life to pre-exist in matter and it reveals itself as a result of a, an intelligence. Okay. We can call it divine intelligence. Some of us call it God, but there's this intelligence that permeates the cosmos and the universe. And this noon contained all of the things that were necessary. So it was the many that were into the one and was called for. And the things that came out of it were, they called the net, the netaru. And they are divine principles and functions. And I would say that they're similar to what we would consider as angels. Some people call these guards, but the Africans understood there was only one divine intelligence that everything else emanated from contrary to some of the stories that they were poly polytheistic. That's not true. People just misinterpret the, the information or, or distort it. And you'll see that as we go along. So now think of this liquid, this fluid. And so this, 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 this netter, Patar conceived in his heart everything that exists and by his, his utterance, the word created them all. So the word, he emerges from these primeval waters in the form of matter. Okay, keep that in mind, matter, a heel. A tomb also emerges from the waters and sits upon the heel. And there were male and female netaru that remain in the primeval waters. Now, so what is this telling us? That water is the source of all things. Think about it. And we know that because we know that bacteria 3.5 billion years ago started forming and that was the beginning of us moving towards the life on the planet as we know it now. And modern science has traced that back to around 3.5 billion years ago. So these Africans over 6,000 years ago got it right when they said that everything started with water, life as we know it. Now, these netaru that remain in the nun were nun and net, which represented the primeval waters and the Kala heaven, ha and heart het, balanced and its opposite limited. Now, those of you who were in on the session last month, remember I talked about we deal in a ream of duality. We're talking about duality here. Kark and Karket, darkness and its opposite light, and Amun and Amunet, the hidden and its opposite visible. They remain in the in the noon. Now, Hatar was represented by a, a, a primordial hill. So what does this really say? It's, it's, it's the energy 
is energy conver conversion in the spirit of creation. Okay? Because the spirit is complemented by the existence of matter. So you had to have something to make this happen. And so this matter and the spirit. And so they're saying that the spirit is pure energy. So matter is energy's physical form, which is what Einstein theory has proven and what quantum physics has proven. That matter and energy are basically the same. It's just in a physical form. But when, it, when you break it down, it's all energy. It also says that there's a life force that moves everything and all. Okay. And so Patar converts this energy at rest, which was in the noon, into energy and motion. He brought it into being. And that Atum is the creative word and source that gave names to all things in the cosmic universe. Because Atum brought four pairs of netter into existence by projecting them from his body. And what were these four pairs of netteru? Shu, air, tefnu, moisture, geb, the earth, and nut, the sky. Okay? So we're talking about the four fundamental principles of, of our existence here on earth. Earth, wind, fire, and water. So, Adam represented fire, shoe air, tefnu moisture, gab earth, and nude sky. So this is, the, this is the order of the cosmos that we're dealing with today. So, when this, these four elements of the universe, and then these that projected from Atum's body, they in turn, uh, Shu, Tefnu, Geb, and Nut gave birth to Haru, which the Greek we named Osiris, a set who was named Isis, and set the opposite of good, and Anithes, the female principle in the unseen world. So this was the uh, Ennead which is the union, union of nine netaru into one god here. Now, remember nine, because they did not just make these numbers up. We are, we are finding out now that these numbers are significant. Okay. The power of nine. Okay, if we, if we take nine, it's one of the most complete numbers that we've ever dealt with. For example, if you take, start with zero, if you look on the left-hand side and you start with zero going up to nine and, and start with nine going down to zero, whenever you add those numbers, they're always equal nine, okay? Always. Conversely, if you start with, with zero and then add nine, and you start with nine and add zero and you subtract, the product is always going to be nine. If you multiply nine, starting with one all the way up to 10, when you break the, the, the product down to a smaller component, it will always equal nine. Nine is a very significant number. And that could be the reason why we have nine planets. So this is very, so they, un, they understood. That's why they had these nine netaru. Now, so, so, so what are the principles that come out of this Memphite theology? There are 10 principles. Water is the source of all things. Modern science has proven that. Creation was accomplished by the unity of Patar and Atum, 
which represents the union of mind and create creative utterance. That Atum was the unmoved mover. Things start brought, he brought forth out from his own uh, creation. And the opposites control the life of the universe. And that the elements of the of creation, you know, fire, water, earth, and air are what comprise the entirety of our universe. So all of this was contained in this theology. So what we're talking about is the oldest creation, story of creation that we've been able to find. Okay. And they all also in this uh, nymphite theology and included, included transmutation where you can take quantities Okay, and then take the elements and quantities and they can transform. For example, if you have water, water is cold and it's a fluid, right? But if you heat it up, okay, it becomes air and it has hot and wet quantities. So it's basically transformed from cold and wet to hot and wet and it transform, transform from water to air. So we're talking about transmutation of the elements of the universe in terms of uh, when they interact with uh, other quantities. So modern science has confirmed that what these Africans were able to create through myth, because in order to bring it into existence, as I indicated, they had to create these stories to bring the unseen into the seen world for it to be understood. Okay. Uh, so they also had created philosophy, and philosophy is the foundation for all knowledge. You got to have a philosophy. You got to have these things in order to start moving a civilization forward. In order to be able to have a system for the acquisition of knowledge and perpetuating that knowledge. Now, to sum this up, and this is in the Hidden Properties of, of Matter by Dr. Uh, Ashby. We start at the bottom. We're talking about first we had the netter nameless one, the hidden one, formless one, self-existence being, is beyond time and space, is pure consciousness supporting all matter. Then we have Patar, who the Greeks renamed Horus, or, oh, and Horus, I'm sorry, they didn't name Patar Horus, which was the mind consciousness that creates matter through thought through thought, poof, it comes, to be, comes into being. And the noon is the, is all of this form matter, but it's just there, okay? It's there. And then, and then Atum, under the direction of Patar, creates all things, the qualities of matter, okay? And this is, it, in, it embodies both female and male quantities. And then we have the netters, which are basically the attributes of nature, earth, wind, fire, water, etc. So this is the progression of this Memphite theology, which our modern science uh, has confirmed in terms of the beginning of the universe. It's, but it's embodied in, in myths in order to bring it forward. And that's very important for us to understand. So the bottom line is that African science is visible and invisible, okay? But in order to bring the invisible uh, to, to light, you have to create these myths in order to bring it forth so people can understand it. And so 
it, it, it encompasses everything. It's all encompassing at the same time. So we know now that the solar system was once a motor gaseous and, and nebula, which a nebula is basically uh, gas and dust, okay? And we know that it was rotating at an enormous speed and the mass cooled down. And as the mass cooled down, it started rotating faster and faster. In fact, that's why we have the, the bulge at the equator because it was rotating so fast that basically you had a bulge in the middle. But it, these pieces were breaking off, these, these rings were ba uh, breaking off and they formed other planets. And then they formed other planets. That's why we have billions and billions and billions of planets. Okay, and we have been able to look back, go all the way back to 13.7 billion years when this, when this Big Bang occurred, or what we call the Big Bang. So we're talking about Atom sits upon the primeval hill, and we're talking about creation and the Big Bang. And we're also talking about atomic energy, because think about it, it came out of the, the noon this water, watery substance, and the heel, patar, that's matter. So what is atomic energy? Water and uranium, which comes from the matter, the earth, okay? And we also know that nature is based on duality and nine is important and we have nine planets. And here's a, 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 a depiction of uh, Sigmund Freud, um, one of the geniuses of the world. And this is what he has on his desk, had on his desk. Now his, his museum is in London. So if you ever go to London, you may wanna check out Sigmund Freud's uh, museum. Now check, what, check out what he has on his desk. Here's Patar. Here's Asar. Here's uh, a set. Um, and we have Haru. Okay, so we have all of these depictions of these African Netaru on his desk. So obvious, it's obvious that. Sigmund Freud was very, very familiar with what I just went through. And with his mind, he could see much more than I'm ever capable of seeing because of his genius, okay? And uh, let me show you some more. Here's his bookshelf and um, some more African uh, statues. And here we have some more heads. So, is it inconceivable to think that with him understanding and, and knowing about the Memphite theology, that it may have some bearing on him being able to come up with E equals MC squared? We'll never know, but we know that he had to know about the Memphite theology. So it may have had some bearing on him coming up with the fact that mass and energy are one of the same. That Africans had figured out over 6,000 years ago. Now I must remind you that you're not gonna get this in your science class. Okay, you're not going to get this. Okay, but uh, when you go back, this is what history shows. Now I'm going to move on to my art because this is another piece of this spirituality and a very important piece. Uh, my art was represented by a a woman with a ostrich feather in her head, and this feather was used in the um, comedic judgment scene 
where after someone had died and their heart was judged as to whether or not they had lived the type of life that would allow them to be able to be presented to a God or whether or not they would have to be tortured and eaten by this monster that was waiting for them. So this, this my art represented uh, the positive aspects of life. And you've all heard his heart is as light as a feather. Well, that's where that, where that that's where that saying came from. It's from, from the principles of Ma'ar. Okay, goes all the way back to ancient Africa. Now, what are some of these divine principles? I have not stolen. Okay, I have not cursed. I have not lied. Okay, I, I have not spoken angrily. Okay, I am not deceitful. I have not stolen anyone's land, okay? I have not cursed. And if you look at the 42 principles of my art, you will see that approximately nine of the 10 commandments are basically have come, were, were included in these 42, okay? And to break it down to pra practicality is basically saying I honor virtue. I benefit with gratitude. When someone gives me something, I'm, I'm grateful, okay? I respect the property of others. I live in truth. I am forgiving. I am open to love in various forms. I give blessings. On and on and on. I am humble. I advance through my own abilities. All of these are embedded in the principles of my art which was the foundation for comedic society. And this is one of the reasons why it's the longest lasting and the greatest civilization known to man, because these were the bedrock. These were the principles that they attempted to live by. And here's another depiction of my art. And, uh, Reading the um, poetry and the, the wisdom of these ancient Africans is mind blowing. For example, here it says, you will free yourself when you learn to be neutral and follow the instruction of your heart without letting things perturb you. This is the way of my art. I mean, this is beautiful. And they, they, they wrote so well, and they were so articulate in their expressions uh, that were written in, in some of these things. It's just mind boggling when you read this, that this was done thousands and thousands of years ago. Okay, now, to sum up my art, we have, we can boil all of the 42 principles down into basically seven. Truth, justice, order, righteousness, reciprocity, balance, harmony, and compassion. If you look at all of the 42, we can narrow those down to the cardinal virtues that, 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 they, uh, that these 42 entail. Okay. And they also had out of these virtues come some profound um, uh, thoughts like control of your actions, devotion of purpose, that when you do something, you devote yourself to it and you try to do the best that you can do. Also faith in yourself in terms of being able to tell the truth and also to assimilate the truth. And, and here are some that are very difficult. Free from resentment when you're unfairly prosecuted or when someone accuses you uh, wrongly. And cultivate the ability to distinguish between the real and, 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 and unreal and right and wrong. These are some really profound principles that we as humans um, 
try to uh, engage in and use throughout our lives. So my art was the, the it was the foundation that that guided this civilization. And the king was a living example of that. The king represented all everything that I talked about in terms of these principles. The king was supposed to be a representation of that. You had some who did it much better than others. And today we can look at the Pope as taking on that role. He is the intermediary between God and the people. So the Pope is supposed to take on these, basically the same role that the king had in, in ancient Kemet. And um, now, despite all of that, and this is the lesson that I think is so important for all of us to uh, understand. That even with this foundation, in this knowledge, we had um, periods which we called intermediary periods. And for the old kingdom or the first golden age, there was peace and trans, uh, 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 tranquility, harmony for 503 years. And we are a little less than what, 200 years and we're struggling. We're having some real dynamics going on in this country in terms of getting away from these principles, okay? But what happened once they had 42 gnomes and the priests were, uh, had um, control over some, uh, some of these gnomes and some of the people started becoming materialistic, greedy. Um, they started seeking power and the civilization started falling apart after over 500 years, over 500 years, they got away from these principles and the civilization went into decline. And when you read what was going on, brother was killing brother. It was horrible. And this is the lesson. It took over a hundred and some years for it to right itself before we could get to the second golden age, which was around 2040 BCE. They went through over a hundred years of a living hell because they got away from these principles. And it also shows us that no matter um, how man tries to be good, that evil will oftentimes overtake man. And when that happens, the civilization goes into decline. So we have to really think about this in terms of the history of the past in terms of what's happening now. Because you cannot maintain a silver society and a civilization based on lies, greed, materialism, not caring about your fellow man and, and dividing people. The civilization will decline. We know that because history tells us that. Because here we have the, one of the greatest civilizations known to man and it declined. Then every time it came back out in the second golden age is because they restored these principles and the civilization then flourished. So we had the second golden age and then they were invaded. Now, during the second golden age, what was the lesson? The lesson was that they were so busy building pyramids and it was a literary age and they were writing about God and, and, and doing all these wonderful things, but they, but they didn't focus on a very key component, the defense of the nation. So they were invaded. Now, the, the entire country wasn't invaded. They were invaded up in the Delta area, which is where Alexander resides now 
but it was enough for these invaders to rule for 200 years before the Nubians and the Ethiopians in the south uh, came in and um, uh, were able to run them out. We have to remember that Nubia and, and Ethiopia were part of this whole uh, uh, Kemetic civilization, okay? It, it, it was like you have uh, for example, parts of Germany where you have other countries that were really, they're just an extension of Germany. People still speak German and they still have German culture, but it's called a different name. But for the most part, they're still German. Okay. So, um, and then, uh, of course, it was basically overrun by the Persian, the Greeks, and the Romans, and then basically they lost it after that. Now the Arabs are controlling that civilization. So, When we talk about knowledge, knowledge is so important of yourself. When you walk into the temples of Kemet, one of the first things you'll see is know thyself. Because without self-knowledge, it's really almost borders on being pathological. Uh, because I had mentioned that you know, you can't, you couldn't be a slave and an African because you just, just couldn't, because you're not going to be enslaved if you are a true African. You're going to basically every day be trying to kill somebody or get out of that situation. So you had, so your whole mindset had to be replaced. And when that happens, you're insensitive to yourself because you're about pleasing someone else and adhering to their dictates versus doing what's best for you. And so your reality is distorted. And then you stumble and bumble because of confusion. And also, you, it's hard for you to accept reality when there's a lack of knowledge of self. Now, to sum all of this up, the female was used as the foundation for ethics and morality. That's why in ancient Africa, you have a, 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 a matriarchal society, not, so, not as much now as in ancient times, where the woman was considered a part of the foundation for ethics and morality, and she was a, a, a major part of the structure of that culture. Okay, and then when you look at this creation story, the, the female was intricately immersed in all of this creation. And when you think about the contrast in Western cosmology, where the woman is the fall guy, okay? Whole different mindset. So in order to expand one's level of consciousness, their mind has to be liberated. And your mind can't be liberated if you are living in someone else's reality that was defined by that other person. And that's why on the temples, it says, know thyself. It is critical. In order to be free, you must find out who you are as an individual. And one of the ways of finding out who you are is to go back and understand your history. Because once the history is understood, then you can begin to make decisions based on more of a realistic view of what's going on. Because without that knowledge, as I indicated uh, last month, you don't know what time of day it is. And you're fumbling and bumbling. You think you do, but you don't. And that's why oftentimes the true history is not taught because people in power know this, okay? Uh, so we see that 
you know, that Netheru and other African uh, deities were on Sigmund Freud's desk. But he wasn't the only one. Many of the leading intellectuals uh, studied African history. And that's why all of us must learn. And you're gonna to have to basically do it on your own because you cannot go to school and learn this. Okay, for the most part. It's not gonna be taught. It's gonna be taught from a Eurocentric perspective where everything starts with Greece. So, that ends what I had to, uh, that, I that I wanted to talk with you about this afternoon. I I I'm, I'm hoping that I didn't confuse you. I was trying to take something, <laughs> these Africans were, they were complex. I mean, they had figured this stuff out. And, and if you don't, I understand, I understand it because it, take, it took 42 years for someone to become a high priest. 42 years of study. Okay, so I'm trying to give you something that was passed down for thousands and thousands of years and that they taught uh, to the brightest students for them to understand and be able to maintain that civilization. But one of the best books that uh, you can read is um, Soul and Legacy by George G.M. James. Um, you know, he was a professor of Greek and logic uh, at, uh, at um, Johnson C. Smith in, in Livingston College. And, um, and he died soon after publishing Stolen Legacy. But he was a giant. And he goes into explaining how the credit that we give to the Greeks, really we, we should be given to the Africans because they went to study uh, in Africa. In fact, the first Greek philosopher, Thales, went to Africa to study and he told his students, and this is in writing, to go to Africa and get your education. Okay, but Thales spent 22 years in Africa and he never claimed that the properties of the right triangle was something that he came up with. And it's ludicrous because when you look at the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, which was built, constructed around 2700 BCE, which was a mile long and a half a mile wide and still standing, there was no way they could have built that structure out of stone without understanding a squared plus B squared equals C squared, or the three, four, five uh, right triangle. That's the only way you can square something so that you know it's square. So it's ludicrous to say that somebody who came along in uh, four or 500 BCE discovered something that Africans have been using for thousands of years and we have the evidence because we can look at the structures that they, that they are still standing, okay? But this is a very important book. Then The Hidden Properties of Matter by Dr. Um, Ashby. Uh, it's a very talented man. Uh, in fact, he lives in Miami. Uh, he's a teacher of yoga. He's a Dean minister and spiritual counselor. And he has a doctor of divinity and holistic healing. A very, very good book to give you a better understanding. And then we have spirituality before religions, okay? Uh, Kaaba. And um, so this is, uh, this book was published this year. It really goes into this in, in depth. It's another good book that I would recommend. Now, to get back to my point of how a lack of knowledge of self impacts us every day. Let's look at Oscar. All of us are familiar with the Oscar. Look at the Oscar, look at Patar, and look at a saw. Okay, look at a saw with the crook and the frail, which represents the duality. The crook is to bring in the, sh the, 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 the shepherd bringing in the sheep, 
with, with, with the principles of my art. However, if things, if need be, they can be, they can be punished with the frail. Okay. And so here we have Oscar, and then we have Asa and Pata. Oscar, Asa and Pata. Oscar, look at the Oscar. Where's his right hand on the top of the Oscar? His left hand is on the bottom. So by us not knowing our history, we would never be able to figure this out. Okay, and this is just one of thousands of things that we see every day where the information and knowledge has been taken from Africa, reshaped, renamed, and we can never understand it or recognize it because our history has not been taught to us for us to be able to understand what we are really seeing. And with that, I conclude uh, this talk. And I hope that you've gotten something out of this and that I haven't confused you. Thank you very much. And Ryan Ho, I can turn it back over to you. OK, thank you. Um, I think we might not have enough time to go into breakout rooms and say hello to everybody, but maybe you have some questions. I know there are some in the chat. And if you want to take a look, uh, Rob, uh, after you stop sharing the screen. Okay. Oh, oh, did I stop? Okay. I think I did stop, didn't I? Hold on. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. Hold on. Yes. Up, up the top, I think. Yeah, I see it. Okay, let me see here. Let me share. I know I want to just, I don't want to stop. Hold on. Okay, Robert. Make move, news, pen, edit. Okay. I, I don't want to news share. Resolve, here it is. Okay, there, here we go. <laughs> Almost there. Okay. Um, it should be atop the screen itself. Yeah. Okay. It says you're screen sharing. I am. So. Um, okay. There we go. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, Good. Got it. Got uh, it. Okay, I got it. Okay. I recommend that uh, take a look at the chat to see what's there. If you want to take any of those questions. Okay. Well, I, I okay. Let me see. Let me look at the chat. Let me see if I. Oh, here it is. Ten questions. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay. Matter at core is just energy. Please explain research findings in physics showing the breakup of a particle resulting in several particles larger than the than the original particle. Dan. Okay, Dan. Yes. But it's still it's still energy. Okay. It, even though it it the particles may break up and they be into seven several uh, numerous different particles there's still energy. The core essence of everything is energy. And in fact, um, let me get into some concepts that I didn't really want to touch on. Be because we are dealing with the five senses and we can't get past our five senses, then what we really see is energy, but it's, it's, it's not a what we see is not a reality. I, I, you know, I didn't want to touch on this because now we're getting into some real philosophical constructs. But, uh, but you're exactly right. But it's still energy. No matter how many 
pieces it breaks up into, whether it gets larger or smaller, is still energy. It's all boils down to energy, everything. No matter how we see it or no matter how we perceive it. Okay. Yeah, okay, uh, let's go up here. Um, Can I respond to that? Uh, yes. Please? Okay, uh, first of all, I think it's very important to note that physicists, including quantum mechanics researchers, are extremely cautious in regard to any interpretations of their findings. Okay. And, and are pretty quick to say and to admit that they don't understand it themselves. Mm -hmm. For example, a good example of that was Richard Feynman who made the statement that if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't. And so, and, and the statement that was made in the talk was that a matter at its core is just energy. Now, Einstein, you cited the, the E equals MC square thing, which basically refers to the idea of the interchangeability between energy and matter. So matter is recognized as a entity, so to speak, unto itself, it would appear by theoretical and research physicists. Yes. Okay. So I, I think we're basically saying the same thing and you're right. I think that, you know, as far as we know now and, and, and there's some pros and cons regarding uh, quantum physics. But as far as we know now, it, it appears that energy and matter are basically the same thing, okay? I mean, so, and I think until someone is able to come up with a way to disprove that, there, 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 there are some pros and cons. Right now, as far as we know, it's exactly like you said, energy and matter are the same, okay? Uh, all right. And what is, um, okay, if you have, okay, you can get to this, but remarkable how Patar brings everything into being with utterance, the word of Legos. The biblical creation story is not original as we know and as you demonstrate. Exactly. I think, you know, all cultures borrow from other cultures. So it's not surprising that we have this, these themes uh, throughout the world, the, the themes of, of duality. Uh, we, we have, um, uh, there's a very good book written by um, uh, uh, Graves, it's Kersey Graves, it's called The 16 Crucified Saviors. We've had 16 saviors who've been crucified. And a number of them were born on December the 25th. That's why when the British uh, got control of India and they were trying to impose Christianity on, on the Indians, when they heard their story, they basically said, well, why should I take your story? And my story is basically the same. Our deeds were born on December 25th and da, 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 da. And so that's why it was very difficult to convert the, the Indians uh, to Christianity because they're saying, well, this is basically the same story that, that we have. So why should I take your story? Okay, so uh, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of these have the, the, the origin. I know that that's, uh, uh, th that's, that's hard for some people to really take because I never really understood when my dad used to tell me the truth hurts, okay? I never understood what that meant until as I got older and I started reading things and doing research on, uh, on uh, information that was contrary to everything that I was taught to believe. And I had an extreme de degree of discomfort, cognitive dissonance, okay? In fact, I'll never forget one night uh, I was reading Man, God, and Civilization by John G. Jackson. It was around 2.30 in the morning. And I really 
I really wanted to put the book down because I thought that God was going to fly out the air and strike me dead. I really had to work through that, that fear. Okay? So um, I understand fully that oftentimes when we're brought up with certain uh, beliefs, we're brought, up, we're brought up with certain things that we live by that have we feel that have worked for us and that it becomes a part of us that is extremely difficult to embrace new information and uh, that may not be what, we, what we've been taught. So I, I understand that. Okay. I think, I think uh, uh, Rob, if I may interrupt a second, Joseph Campbell did it for me to uh, okay. study the comparative uh, analysis of religions, that it's a recurring kind of uh, uh, mythology uh, in all of those religions. Yes. Yeah. And I think the takeaway is that all of the religions have 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 are talking about goodness and trying to live the life of whatever deity that uh, is prevalent in that particular lit, uh, religion. And so the bottom line is that every day that we uh, are wake up, that we should strive to be God-like and whatever God that is, you know, that's what you try to do because you're trying to basically live in accordance with the rules of, of uh, and principles of my art. I mean, that's what it boils down to. So it doesn't matter about the religion, it's the, it's the people who are in the religion. Like all of this conflict we see, like what's going on now in Nigeria with, with, with these various uh, uh, Islam sects. It's not Islam. It's the people in that religion who are causing all that, that turmoil and killing people and murdering people. Okay, so it's the people. It's not necessarily the religion. Okay, uh, let me see. Anything else here? Um, yes. Okay. Oh, Uncle Robert, this is great information. Can I please get a copy of this footage? Uh, yes. Um, I think Ron Ho will send something out as to um, how you can uh, view this again if you desire. Okay, I think that's it, Ron Ho. That's all I see. Okay. If there are any other questions, raise your hand, unmute, and ask. Okay, Dr. Ayuka Sowala. Yes. Um... Brother Whiting, we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for the wealth of information that you have shared with us this evening. I'm a little bit familiar with some of the things that you have said, and nothing that you said really conflict with what I had already known to be the new truth. Um, I was thinking as you were speaking about the Native um, the, uh, Americans that they did not accept it. And I'm thinking that, and this is just uh, our yokeology, that the uh, Africans, had they not been enslaved and stripped of the spirituality, then they would have had the wherewithal to reject the new modern day Christianity. And that's what I say, it is modern Christianity. It is not the ancient spirituality that the Africans embraced years and years and years ago. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that. Oh, there's Robbie. How you doing, Robbie? <laughs> okay, I, 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 didn't, I didn't see you until a minute ago. Hey, I'm doing fine, thank you. Okay, great. Um, but see, this is what happened. Look, look at what's happening in this country. We have people who, who call themselves Christians and they support, and I don't want to get political, but I, I got to bring this up. They support a pathological liar. They support a man who's been unfaithful to his wife, who's assaulted women, who disrespects people. So 
how can you be a Christian and support a, a God like that? I mean, it's it's just it's just a, a direct contradiction. So it's not the religion, it's the people. Because Christianity doesn't teach that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's an that's an example. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. It's now 25 minutes till the uh, other debate that will sound probably a little bit less here. <laughs> thank you very much for being here. I look forward to seeing you again on November 19. Okay, all right. Thank you, Ron Ho, and everybody be safe and enjoy the debates. Thank you, Rob. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hi, Carol. How you doing? Uh, oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see you. I didn't see you. I you, 